My dear friends, the subject this morning reminds us that the faith of God's people transcends national boundaries. And I think we've had an introduction to that already by the various accents that have come from this pulpit. And mine is the only normal one so far, but <laughs> to my ears. But it shows you how, how transcending the grace of God is over people and nations. The subject is the Synod of Dort, the doctrine of grace defined. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the background to the Synod of Dort and then deal with the details or some of the details very briefly of the deliverances in Dort. That is to say what are normally called the canons of Dort and then come to some applications towards the end. When we come to the Synod and Canons of Dort, we're perhaps not in comfortable territory, those of us in the United Kingdom. We're not so au fait with them and their significance for the development of the Reformed faith. Because the, the three forms of unity, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism and then the Canons of Dort are not part of our standards as such, and so we perhaps ignore them or at least don't know so well about them. We may think that these are explicitly Dutch with limited relevance outside the Netherlands or of the continental churches in general. Yet, as one historian put it, the Synod of Dort reached the high water mark uh, in ca Calvinistic creed making. And Peter de Jong went even farther when he wrote uh, this was in 1968, um, which was the 350th year uh, commemoration of the Synod of Dort. Um, he said, few creeds formulated by the Christian churches have received either such fulsome praise or bitter criticism as the canons of Dort. To a large degree, these judgments evidence the spiritual sympathies of those engaged in evaluating what has been widely recognized as the greatest of all ecclesiastical assemblies held by the Reformed churches. That is quite a claim, isn't it? But the Scottish Presbyterian historian, beloved of we Presbyterians north of the border, William Cunningham, would agree with such a view. He said, the Synod of Dort marks one of the most important eras in the history of Calvinistic theology, Christian theology. And it is important to possess some acquaintance with the theological discussions which gave occasion to it. No synod or council was ever held in the church whose decisions, all things considered, are entitled to more deference and respect. But why should this synod of Dort and its deliverances, why should this be thought the greatest of all ecclesiastical assemblies? And why is it important to possess some acquaintance with the discussions of the Synod of Dort? It is arguable, in answer to this, that it produced the most explicit statement of historic Calvinism, which became, the, in, effect, the, in effect, the benchmark of a fully scriptural expression of the doctrines of free and sovereign grace. This was definitive for the Reformed churches. It became doctrinally axiomatic for Reformed churches throughout the world from that critical point on. 400 years ago, this was something which would have an impact which reverberates down to the present. It did not define Calvinism in that Calvinism is bright, broader than the deliverances at Dort, but it did contain the substance of it. So what was the issue that arose uh, in the Synod of Dort, or that, that was the, the, which was the, the, the uh, way in which, uh, the reason for which there was such a synod? Well, the history of the Reformed churches after the Reformation was invariably intertwined with political as well as ecclesiastical tensions. We see that in the Scottish Church. We see it in the case of the Reformation in Scotland. We'll see it later in relation to the Covenanters particularly. <laughs> that was true of the United Provinces of the Netherlands after the establishment of the Calvinistic Church in the middle years of the 16th century. Calvinists were doggedly supported, supportive of William of Orange. 
This William of Orange was William I, incidentally, 1533 to 1584. And uh, they were supportive of, the, the, of William of Orange against the Roman, Catholics, the Roman Catholic Spain. But the northern provinces of Netherlands were under the yoke at that point of Philip II of Spain after 1555 until they revolted in 1579. Uh, this uh, coincided with the Union of Utrecht. And, it was, and they declared themselves independence from Spain two years later. However, at that time, they had, they had the experienced great persecution in which possibly as many as 100,000 Dutch Protestants were martyred. Almost from the first, the Calvinistic churches held to the Belgic Confession, which is dated to 1561. And from 1581, the churches increasingly subscribed, informally, the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, at this point, the Reformed faith was the recognized state religion of the United Provinces, as they were called. The civil authorities, however, had a significant say in the recognized state religion of the United Provinces. They had a significant say in church affairs. But there was no stipulation formally in the church that ministers should subscribe the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. This was a distinct weakness in maintaining, uh, in maintaining consistently the Calvinistic doctrinal position expressed in the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. And that was a situation which allowed because there wasn't a formal subscription of these things at that point, it allowed the Arminian controversy to arise in the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. The issues were, or the issues with which they were confronted were, were the teachings of Arminius in line with the confession and catechism of the church? And moving on from that, did the Reformed church have a right to depose any of those views which conflicted with the confessional position ostensibly held by the Reformed Church. Now, in the light of this conflict that there was, that rose from the teaching of Arminius, there was a call for a national synod to resolve, resolve issues. At this point, Jacob Arminius gained influence in the church. Let me explain who he was. Arminius was born in South Holland, um, some of the Dutch people here might correct me in this. Uh, the, the national boundaries were somewhat different uh, in the six, 16th and 17th centuries than uh, they are today. But South Holland, now Belgium and Luxembourg, uh, he was born in South Holland in 1560, studied for the ministry under Theodore Beza in Geneva, and became a minister in Amsterdam in 1588. Almost immediately, questions were raised on account of his preaching, not least his exposition of the Book of Romans. Um, he considered that Paul in Romans 7, for example, was referring to the unregenerate, not the regenerate man, as most Reformed people interpreted this passage. But also in chapters 8 to 11, he began to stress man's free will. Controversy arose. And his views were considered to be out of line with the Belgic Confession, and particularly uh, to Article 16 on divine election. Like so many liberals in recent times, whilst there was a professed adherence to the standards, there was an understanding of the terms which contradicted the plain meaning of the standards. The committed Calvinists were concerned about what was coming out of Arminius, especially after 1602, when Arminius was appointed a professor of theology at Leiden on the promise that he would not teach anything in conflict with the Calvinistic doctrines of the churches. In reality, Arminius, twice to give that assurance, was duplicitous. It's amazing how men often, who, of whom some doubts arise, get into positions of teaching it was a scourge, certainly, in the Scottish Reformed Church in the 19th century and led to tremendous declension. This is the case with Arminius, one is inclined to say. 
In reality, he was duplicitous. In public lectures, he apparently adhered to the pledge given, whereas in private instruction, he expressed doubts and disaffection about certain doctrines. Now, it's often happened that men in such positions in churches influence generations of students and thereby transform the doctrinal outlook of churches. Very often, ministers and professors of theology have taken their livings while being unconvinced of the confessional position that they are pledged to uphold. And this has been a scourge of the churches uh, throughout uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, right up to the present day. Well, there was no resolution of issues in Arminius' own day by the time of his passing in 1610. However, matters were exacerbated after his death by his followers, by those who had been influenced by his aberrant teaching when he was at Leiden, and earlier, no doubt, as well. And a group met in Gouda in 1610 and framed what became known as a remonstrance in which they, were, in which they rejected uh, certain Calvinistic positions, commonly accepted Calvinistic positions. They stated their position, these remonstrants, in five articles, which went a fair distance to defining the Arminian position, like the five points of Arminianism. This was no minor blip, however, because to these five articles, 46 ministers signed their name, attached their name. So what did these articles teach? The, the remonstrants, the... Um, Arminian position formulated. The 40 or so men who gathered at Gouda in six, January 1610 agreed and signed a remonstrance, a, a petition to be forwarded, which they forwarded to, not to the church, but to the political authorities, to whom they made their case and presented their complaints about how their opponents were falsely accusing them. Implicit here was their view, of, incidentally, of the authority of the state over the church because they could go straight to the state to make a decision which would be in their favor in relation to the church. It was, of course, a serious challenge to the church. And the question was, well, well the questions were, were their views right and should they be tolerated? Simple as that. Not so simple, really, because it came to a discussion of the issues and the substance of these articles of the Arminians. So the remonstrants made five propositions, five points. First of all, divine election was seen to be conditioned by foreseen faith. People were elected by God on the basis of the faith that God saw uh, anticipated in them. And the text they cited there was John 3.36. It was maintained, secondly, that Jesus died for all men and every man. In other words, they held to an unlimited or universal atonement, whilst recognizing, quote, that no one actually enjoys this forgiveness of sins except the believer. And the text they cite here are John 3.16 and 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. Then thirdly, the necessity for regeneration if a person is to be saved. Now that sounded orthodox enough. And certainly it is true that a man needs to be born again if they are to be saved. The, and it sounded orthodox enough, though later it came to be clear that their understanding of this in a way, what, what, they understood this in a way which undermined the reality of the depravity of human nature. But they cited John 13 and 5 in support of this. The fourth point was this, with respect to the mode of grace, the grace of God, it is not irresistible, that is a quotation, as it was maintained, was taught in Acts chapter 7 and elsewhere. And the fifth point was, of these articles of the Arminians, there is uncertainty about the perseverance of the saints and whether or not the believer can fall away. And this article, as I mentioned, was signed by 46 ministers. So we come to the response to this, the counter-remonstrance, the Calvinistic response, because the following year in 1611, the Calvinists produced a counter-remonstrance representing 
or presenting seven articles on the matter raised by the five Arminian articles. First of all, the whole human race with Adam fell into sin and became corrupt. By nature, children of wrath and dead in trespasses and sins. They had no more, quote, no more power to convert themselves truly and believe in Christ than a corpse has power to raise itself from the dead. From this mass of humanity, of his mere grace, according to his eternal purpose, he, ch he has chosen some to salvation in Christ, passing by others, leaving them in their sins. That was the first point of the counter-remonstrance. The second was this. Not only adults who believe in Christ and walk worthy of the gospel are to be reckoned God's elect, but also children of the covenant, as long as they don't manifest the contrary. Quote, therefore, believing parents, when their children die in infancy, have no reason to doubt the salvation of these children. The third was this, in election, God does not look for faith or conversion in the elect or the right use of gifts as the grounds of the election. His purpose is to bestow faith and perseverance in godliness. Fourth, to this end, he has given them Christ, whom he delivered up to the death of the cross, to save the elect and the elect only. Five, the gospel is the instrumental means through the work of the Holy Spirit to convert the sinner and bring them to repentance and faith. Sixth, though there is an ongoing struggle against indwelling sin and the weakness of the flesh, the same Holy Spirit prevails so that God's elect will not finally lose true faith and fall away once bestowed upon them. And seventh, notwithstanding this, there is no excuse through this teaching for carelessness. Those truly saved and grafted into Christ, is the word they use, will produce spiritual fruit in their lives. There will be a desire for the Lord to, quote, to, Lord, to keep them standing in his undeserved grace. Now, this controversy between the remonstrance and the counter-remonstrance drew in the, pol the politicians of the United Provinces of the Reformed and the, and the Reformed Church. It led eventually to a decision that a synod be convened on the 1st of November, 1618, and it is probably true to say, as Philip Schaff maintained, that it, is, it was the only synod of an ecumenical character in the history of the Reformed Churches. And it is clear that foreign delegates were invited to this synod in order to lend credibility and strength and weight to the decisions of the synod. The synod practically first met on the 13th of November uh, 1618 at Dort or Dortrecht. So that we are coming up uh, very soon to the 400th anniversary of this synod. We turn then, that's the background, we turn then to the synod of Dort itself. It's perhaps an irony that the one name, at least perhaps to ourselves, perhaps not to those of you who are Dutch here, I don't know how many are Dutch or of a Dutch background here, but it's perhaps an irony that the one name that is really familiar to us in this whole controversy that led to the Synod of Dort is the name of Arminius. I mean, if you all had a bit of paper there and noted down uh, Dutch uh, members of the Synod of Dort, we would be hard pushed to get more than one or two, I dare say. Now, down the years, there has been a running debate within most sections of the worldwide church between Arminianism on the one hand and Calvinism on the other hand. Arminius, Arminian, Arminius had passed away before the synod was convened. We mentioned his passing in 1610, um, before, the, the, before the, 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 the synod met. But his name is inextricably bound, in, 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 inextricably bound up with the decisions and the discussions at the, at the synod held at Dort between November the 13th, 1618, and May the 9th, 1619. Therefore, in any debate about Calvinism and the doctrines of grace, we inevitably travel to Dort, and we hear the discussions, and we read the decisions, the canons of that synod. And it defines for us more effectively than any other of the confessions, in fact, the nature and substance of Calvinism. 
In addition to all this, there's the nature of the synod itself. It wasn't just a parochial issue within the Dutch or Belgic nations. It had distinct international aspect with delegates from many European countries. There were, as part of the um, membership of the Synod of Dort, there were politi politi uh, political commissioners from the States General of the United Republic of the Netherlands. There were 18 of them, uh, political commissioners. Besides this, there were 60 delegates from the Netherlands, 18 of whom were elders and the others ministers. And there were four of th those uh, ministers, theological professors. In addition to this, there were 32 delegates from other European, or as it would be described then, imperial t territories and countries, including five delegated by James VI and I from the Anglican Church. One of these uh, five was uh, a man called Walt Walter Balkenhall, who was to represent, although he was a appointed by, commissioned by James VI and I from the Anglican Church, he was to represent the Church of Scotland. There was one representative from the Church of Scotland, Walter Balkenhall. There were also 14 defenders of Arminius' uh, Arminius's positions called remonstrances cited to appear at the Synod. There were 18 committees. On each question before the Synod, the various committees were to formulate an answer. They reported back to the, to, to the committee, and these were then collated by a moderaman who prepared the final decision subsequently subjected to the vote of approval. The principal thing, not the only thing, but the principal thing in the synod was the Arminian controversy. And the best known Arminians within the churches were invited. They came, 12 of them at least, came as an organized group ready to counter the counter remonstrance. They treated the synod as an opposing party and they would not submit to it. Their spokesman was one Simon Episcopius and uh, it, it was pretty well a battle. Asked to put their objections to the confession and catechism in writing, uh, these men refused. The chairman asked if they accepted the remonstrance of 1610, that is the five the five articles of 1610 that had been agreed by the 46, they remained silent. The Arminians were recalcitrant. They left the synod itself in January 1619, and thereafter the synod addressed itself to the five articles of 1610. The decisions in, f in the form of canons were formulated. There were 93 separate articles with an additional numerous paragraphs attached to the various articles expressing a rejection of errors. The canons were signed by all the delegates, including the five appointed by James VI and I. Uh, I'll touch on this a little later because that was significant. The, the canons were signed by all the delegates on the 23rd of April, 1619. So much for the background then of the um, Synod of Dort. What about the decisions, the canons of Dort? Well, there were five heads of doctrine uh, in the deliverances of the Synod. The first head of doctrine was divine predestination. The second head was on the death of Christ and man's redemption. The third and fourth, which are always conflated, these heads together embrace creation, the creation, corruption, and conversion of man. In other words, they embraced total depravity and irresistible grace. The fifth head was the perseverance of the saints. Now, one can understand the acrostic tulip from these heads. I'll come to this later. Not that they were framed in the order established by tulip, which is so mem memorable or memorizable to us, Tulip is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. But the original articles framed by the canons of Dawn don't go in that order, and the acrostic tulip was something that was added later, but I'll mention that later on. So, when we consider these decisions, we will first of all take heads three and four. Heads three and four 
refer to total depravity and irresistible grace, as I mentioned. Now, the, the canons actually begin, as I mentioned, with divine predestination, but in that article, it begins in this way. All men have sinned in Adam, lie under the curse, and are deserving of eternal death. Straightforward statement. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, the, 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 opening, the opening phrase, the opening sentence of the first head on divine predestination. Therefore, God would have done no injustice by leaving them to perish and delivering them over to, the co to condemnation on account of their sin. Where did that come from? It came from Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It comes from Romans chapter 6, 23. Uh, the wages of sin is death. And as this, uh, as this doctrine, uh, as this teaching is expounded more fully in heads 3 and 4, it makes sense to think of these heads first. This takes us to the third and fourth heads of doctrine, the creation, corruption, and conversion of man. The issue with the Arminians related to the effect of the fall and the extent of man's corruption. Obviously, that impacted on the doctrine of grace in man's conversion. To Arminians, man only suffered partial depravity and had an ability to cooperate in conversion. The Synod affirmed what it believed to be the biblical doctrine of man's total depravity and loss of free will. That is to say, free will to save oneself. As distinct from free will just to go your own way in a sinful, corrupt direction, which is man's natural tendency by nature from, from the fall. Sin has brought upon man spiritual death making the regenerating grace of God, of the Holy Spirit, altogether necessary. Whilst there is a radical corruption in man's nature as a result of the fall, this doesn't mean, of course, well, perhaps not obviously, but it doesn't mean that man has ceased to be man. He is still has, says, the, says, the, says these articles, has understanding and will, though radically corrupted. He still has some quote, glimmerings of natural light whereby he retains some knowledge of God, of natural things, and of the difference between good and evil. This might, be, might have been called in, in, in the Dutch terms common grace uh, subsequently. But there is no hope now of being able to rise from his fall by his own free will. A work of sovereign grace is necessary. And when the preaching of the gospel results in conversion and faith, this must be wholly attributed to God. Whilst it takes place within the, with the use of means, it isn't worked simply by external preaching or moral suasion or man's cooperation, but by a supernatural work inwardly by the, wrought by the Spirit. Thus, the fallen sinner, dead in trespasses and sins, is satisfied, quote, to know and experience that by this grace of God they are enabled to believe with the heart and to love their Savior. These heads then, three and four, cover total depravity and irresistible grace. But then, secondly, we turn to head number one of the canons, divine election and reprobation. The first head, as we've seen, uh, actually begins with the plight of man which is why we looked at head three and four first. The wages of sin is death. It set the scene for the, necess for the necessity of the divine initiative in salvation. The plight of man, the corruption of man, the fallen nature of man sets the scene for the necessity of divine intervention. Otherwise, none of us would be saved and none of you would be here today apart from the divine intervention and salvation. It also happily identifies something very precious in his saving work. And this is a quotation. In this the love of God was manifested, that he sent his only begotten Son into the world, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now the means are also highlighted. Uh, the messengers of the joyful tidings by whose ministry people are called to repent and believe. That is their means. It is a matter of deliverance from the wrath of God 
and receiving eternal life. Salvation is by grace. Some receive and some do not. This proceeds from where? It proceeds from God's eternal decree. In His unchangeable purpose from before the foundation of the world, that's where it derives from. And this we see is clearly taught from the passage which we read earlier, which your pastor read earlier from Ephesians chapter 1 and elsewhere in the Scriptures, Romans chapter 8, for instance. The canons make it clear that the basis of election is the sovereign purpose of God and not foreseen faith or the obedience of man. As the Arminians affirmed, affirmed or inferred, Rather, they are chosen to faith and obedience. This is clear, for instance, in that passage in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. They are chosen from before the foundation of the world. They are chosen to faith and obedience. They are chosen to be people who will be holy. Now, assurance is encouraged not by prying into the secret and deep things of God, but by observing in themselves the fruits of election, true faith in Christ, filial fear, a godly sorrow for sin, a hungering and thirsting after righteousness, as themselves marks of having received the quickening and regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and being among the elect of God. The canons are pastoral. This is, this is something that is, is, is necessary to say. They are pastoral. Um, and they are experiential. For example, in this head, a divine election, re regeneration, uh, and, and reprobation, there is this said, the sense and certainty of election afford to the children of God additional matter for daily humiliation before him, for adoring the depths of his mercies, for cleansing themselves and rendering grateful returns. This is lovely. Grateful returns of ardent love to him who first manifested so great love towards them. This head then covers divine election and just reprobation. That is to say, the passing by of some. Whilst all this is within the sovereign of God's decree, election is to be understood as a display of grace and mercy, whereas reprobation is, seen, is to be seen as displaying God's sovereign, quote, God's sovereign, most just, irreprehensible, and unchangeable good pleasure. Thirdly, considering the second head, what we might understand as limited atonement the death of Christ and man's redemption. In, re in relation to redemption, the issue was, consistently with the justice of God, how can sinners be accepted by God? Consistently with the justice of God, how can sinners be accepted by God? How can there be a satisfactory basis for the salvation of sinners? It's a question. It's a question of questions. For any person walking upon the earth, Left to ourselves, in our sinful state, our sins must be punished. Quote, not only with temporal but eternal punishments, both in body and soul, unquote. Unless satisfaction is made to the justice of God. Now, we are unable to do this. So the question is, who and how? Ah, uh, we quote, we, we, we read, He gave His only begotten Son for our surety, who was made sin and became a curse for us, and in our stead, that He might make the satisfaction to divine justice on our behalf. There it is, the heart of the gospel. The death of the Son of God is the perfect sacrifice. It has infinite worth. Quote, sufficient to expiate the sins of the whole world, unquote. This must be so, given that the person who provided the sacrifice was a perfect man and the only begotten Son of God. Two natures in one person forever. The same eternal and infinite essence as the Father and the Holy Spirit. 
It is interesting, it is important, and is notable here that the canons make a clear affirmation of the free, what we call the free offer of the gospel. Quote, this is in, this is in uh, Article 2, Section 5, this promise that whosoever believes in Christ crucified shall not perish but have eternal life, together with the command to repent and believe, ought to be declared and published to all nations and to all persons promiscuously and without distinction to whom God, out of his good pleasure, sends the gospel. There is no excuse for not having a free offer of the gospel. Promiscuously, it says here, and without distinction to whom God out of his good pleasure, sends the gospel. Now that many do not repent and believe is not owing to any defect or deficiency in the sacrifice offered by Christ. It rests upon themselves. Now the question arises then, for whom did he die? This is the sacrifice. This is the basis of acceptance for the sinner. But for whom did, did he die? The answer is that it extends to all the elect. This is the limited atonement. This is limited atonement and particular redemption. Upon such is bestowed justifying faith and the other saving gifts of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the atonement was effectively to redeem out of every people, tribe, nation, and language, quote, all those and only those, unquote, who were chosen from eternity for salvation and given by the Father to the Son. They are the sheep for whom Christ died. This counters, you see, the Arminian affirmation that the Father ordained the Son to die on the cross without a certain or definite decree to save anybody in particular. This is seen to contradict the clear teaching of, script of Christ. I lay down my life for the sheep, and I know them. John 10, 15, John 10, 27, Isaiah 53, 10. The benefits of the death of Christ cannot be applied equally to all. What God intended, willed by the atonement, was actually achieved by Christ in his death. It secures their salvation. Now, the Arminians taught universal atonement, that Christ died for all equally, but not so that all are finally saved or redeemed. By contrast, the canons view the atonement as including its effective application. As someone has said, Fred Kluster, Dort here teaches a definite or particular atonement, which includes definite or particular redemption. So we come to head five, which is the perseverance of the saints. The canons were very clear on this point. Quote, those whom God, according to his purpose, calls to the communion of his saints, our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the, uh, uh, the communion of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and regenerates by the Holy Spirit, he also delivers from the dominion of and slavery of sin. Though in this life he does not altogether deliver them from the body of sin and from the infirmities of the flesh. Again, in this case, there's a touching pastoral aspect to so much of the teaching on this point, perse perseverance. There is still indwelling sin, and therefore, quote, perpetual reason to humble themselves before God and flee for refuge to Christ crucified, to mortify the flesh more and more by the spirit of prayer and by holy exercises of piety, and so on. There's a clear encouragement to persevere, to be persevering. Perseverance is not a matter of mere passivity. It is something that is in the active case. Though the believer cannot fall away, uh, the, the, the canon says, the weakness of the flesh cannot prevail against the power of God, they may from time to time deviate from the guidance of divine grace. And therefore, they need to be constantly watchful in prayer so as not to be led into temptation. Now, this watchfulness is to be nurtured 
by the examples of lamentable, heinous sins such as David, Peter, and other saints of Scripture. A motive for the mortification, a watchfulness about sin in our lives. Such sins are offensive to God and encouraging neither of assurance nor perseverance. We are to be watchful of our hearts, watchful of our hearts diligently. Yet the purpose of their election is not frustrated and the grace of adoption and state of justification we read are not forfeited or lost. In all this, there is to be on the one hand a resting upon God and reliance upon the work of Christ and upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, the active pursuit of active pursuit on the part of the believer of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The question is, um, well, um, uh, in, in, in this connection, it's interesting what Paul writes in 1, Thessal uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, he says it's, it's very striking. He says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election by God. And our ears prick up. How do we know our election of God? And he goes on then to answer, the gospel came to them in power and in the Holy Spirit, and they showed the fruits of grace. Now, the canons are at pains to emphasize the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, that this does not encourage licentiousness in behavior or carelessness in following the holy ordinances and the means of grace. And this all countered the Arminian notion that perseverance is not to be seen as a fruit of election. And it flies in the face of Romans the Arminian notion flies in the phrase of Romans chapter 8 and verses 32 to 35. It contradicted the Arminian notion that the saved soul can sin a sin unto death and without special revelation can have no confidence of actually persevering in this life. What the canons say of this doctrine could be applied to all their deliverances. And we quote, Satan abhors it, the world ridicules it, the ignorant and hypocritical abuse it, and the heretics oppose it. However touchingly, they conclude, the bride of Christ has always most tenderly loved and constantly defended it as an inestimable treasure, and God, against whom neither counsel nor strength can prevail, will dispose her so to continue to the end. Now to this, now to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Just a word about the consequences and significance of the outcome of the Synod of Dort. The purpose of the Synod, and consequently the canons of Dort, the deliverances, was to establish, quote, perspicuous, clear, simple, and ingenuous, straightforward, or frank, declaration of the orthodox doctrine on the issues raised raised in the Belgic churches. And this was done positively with these deliverances, to which were appended rejection of errors that I mentioned earlier. Uh, sadly, uh, sadly or happily, um, depending on which way you look at it, an immediate consequence was the deposition of 200 remonstrant ministers, Arminians, from the office, uh, though of these 40 were restored by accepting, coming to recognize the rightness, the biblical rightness. And bear in mind that in all these deliverances, there is, there is uh, exegetical and biblical teaching in support, uh, given in support of all the, all the articles, and it makes very edifying reading to go through them in that connection. Forty were restore, restored after accepting the decisions. And important, um, as important as the controversial doctrinal issues of the Synod were, the, the question of producing a new translation of the Bible in Dutch language arose, and this resulted in the Staten Bible finally published, fi uh, authorized or, or, or commissioned by the Synod of Dort in 1618 and finally completed in 1637. And it, it is a version we read faithfully translated from the original languages and indeed is to be considered one of the best translations of the Reformation period. Now the deliverances themselves are comprehensive of the doctrines of grace. We have, in a real sense, seen that this, this morning. 
There's a clear concern throughout to provide scriptural support for every proposition and every negative rejection. It was very clear, all very clear and effectively, it, it, it was all very clear uh, and effectively settled the doctrine of the, uh, of the Reformed churches. So much so that historic Calvinism is really defined in these canons. Not that the five points of Calvinism are def definitive of def Calvinism, by no means. For Calvinism is a comprehensive thing. It's a worldview. Because there is such a, such a focus on the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of God's grace, it is a worldview. It, 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 is, it is a life system so persuasively uh, stated by Abram Kuyper in his 1898 lectures on Calvinism at Princeton. And Henry Van Til also in 1959 wrote a book, The Calvinistic Concept of Culture, which gives this breadth of the Calvinist's outlook on life. Incidentally, the use of the acronym TULIP clearly derives from the deliverances of, Do the, the, of, of Dort, 1618-19. There's a certain logic to it, and they show the interrelationship of the truths. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Now, from what I've said before, it, it, they weren't formulated in that order. And indeed, the earliest use of TULIP as an acronym in this connection appears to have been as recently as 1905 by one, the Reverend Cleland Boyd McAfee, in a lecture before the Presbyterian Union in Newark, New Jersey, uh, as uh, recorded by one William Vale writing in the New Outlook in 1913. But earlier than that, Robert Dabney, R.L. Dabney, wrote a booklet described as the Five Points of Calvinism. Uh, this uh, was published in 1895, though he did not use the acronym TULIP in the structure of his work on the five points of Calvinism. But TULIP seems appropriate because of the Dutch connection and because it does provide a nice acronym for the, the substance of Calvinism. Now, though best known uh, in the Dutch Reformed churches, as one of the three forms of unity, the canons of Dort have been widely influential in the Reformed churches. <laughs> there are interesting cases, uh, and this c touches uh, with the Scottish Presbyterian Church. Um, there was an interesting case before the General Assembly of the Scottish Church in 1638. They, rela they related to accusations of Arminianism. And it's clear that the canons of Dort were taken as a standard of orthodoxy. For example, there was one James Ochenleck, that's a good Scottish name, it's an Ochenleck, minister of Kettens, that is in Persia, and he was subjected to, to uh, we read actually, this is a quote, James Ochenleck, uh, minister of Kettens, was subjected to a further investigation. He denied defending the doctrine of universal grace as an integral part of an Arminian theology. He intimated only that its inclusion in Lutheran doctrine gave it some kind of legitimacy. He admitted appealing to John 2, 1 and 2 Peter 2, quote, but I was never of the, that opinion that Christus mortus est pro singulus, Christ's death is for each. The next day he was told to go home and approach his kirk, his kirk and presbytery, quote, and satisfy them as, as um, and satisfy them in as solemn a manner as can be, which meant subscription to the acts of the Synod of Dort. Apparently, he was successful and was restored. Clearly, Arminianism also raised its head in England. No surprise there. Um, one of the English delegates at the Synod of Dort was one Bishop Joseph Hall, I believe he's the Bishop of Lincoln. After uh, his return from the Synod of Dort, he was distressed to find that Arminian heresy had been gaining ground in England. And he said, uh, it is said, Quote, not many years after, set, this is Hall speaking, um, some, some time after he'd been at Dort, not many years after settling at home, it grieved my soul to see our own church begin to sicken of the same disease which we had endeavored to cure in our neighbors. What can we say in conclusion? There's a rather good conclusion 
a book commemorating the Synod of Dort from Cornelius Van Til. He says this at the end of a, an end of a, um, um, an article on the significance of Dort for today. The followers of Dort, together with their brethren, the followers of Westminster, alone have the wherewithal with which to proclaim the gospel of the sovereign grace of God to all. Today the battle of Armageddon is on. It is up to those who prize their heritage as the children of the Reformation, and more specifically, of the Reformed Reformation, to lead all the true followers of the self-identifying Christ of Scripture against unbelief without and against unbelief within the church. Let me just conclude uh, with um, one or two reflections on uh, how the doctrines of grace, as, for example, formulated by the canons of Dort, how they encourage believers, how they will encourage you, ought to encourage you today. I think, first of all, this, they preserve us from undue levity or irreverence in the life of faith and in the worship of God. They are a bulwark against a mere man-centered religion because the focus is on the sovereignty and holiness and majesty and power of God. But no more than that, they instill confidence in God for whom nothing is impossible. What a source of encouragement that is for a believer. Nothing is impossible with him. Therefore, we do not need to fear what man can do, the worst that man can do, what governments can do, what anybody does. He is over all his works. This is what we affirm, and we are encouraged by it. But then they bring home to us the realization, the important realization, that prayer will be effective that there is nothing hollow in our praying. It will be effective because he is the hearer and the answerer of prayer. After all, he is, as we affirm, as the doctrines of grace affirm, he is the God of all grace. He is sovereign, and he is the hearer and answerer of prayer. Furthermore, we can be assured of the success of the gospel of the success of our evangelism, of the success of mission, because he will accomplish his purposes. We leave that to him. We don't second guess. We just go with the gospel, and we pray to the Lord, Lord, apply. Lord, work in thy sovereign grace to bring these souls who are hearing this word to submit to King Jesus, to bow the knee to him and humbly come to him with repentance and faith. It tells us, in other words, and this is a great encouragement to all believers in any age, it tells us that he controls all, he, he orders all, so that his will will be done in heaven and upon the earth, and none can stay his hand, nor say unto him, What doest thou? And what does that tell us, and how does that encourage us? It tells us and encourages us that he is triumphant. Ultimately, and in the end, all else is folly, only trusting him, following him, and keeping his word. And may the Lord bless these thoughts to us. Thank you for your patience in listening. Once again, we're very indebted to the Reverend John Kennedy for that excellent treatment of Dort and its canons. I'm sure it's been very instructive to us today, full of information. He's presented to us a comprehensive view and obviously a well-researched view of the background to the Synod and the outcome of the Synod. And we rejoice to hear these things. They're not academic to us and something in the way of information only, but we have a, a heart interest in these things. This is 
this is what we affirm. This is where we stand. And this morning it's been very heartening for me to hear these things uh, declared in such an able way and buttressed by scripture. And it can only do us lasting good to reflect upon these things. Calvinism may be controversial in some circles. It's not controversial in this circle. Here we stand by the grace of God and we embrace the Calvinistic faith of our fathers and thank God for it. It's the backbone to our whole theology and we go forth believing in a sovereign God of grace whose purposes will come to pass despite hell's fury and man's opposition. The kingdom will come and it will come with power and with great blessing. And we are encouraged very much to pray to that end. So thank you so much, Mr. Keddie, for that excellent treatment.